Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton and Greg White with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Today's show, we have got one of the most unique industry leaders around. Jamin Alvidres will be joining us here today. So not only is he one of the most in the know uh, thought leaders around, but he is one of the more energizing figures in industry. So stay tuned for what promises Greg. No be doubt. A great episode, right? No doubt. I am so excited. Just having him around makes me excited. <laughs> right? So I'm glad to join you. It makes us smile a lot more and feel a lot better about ourselves, right? Fellow Chiefs fan. Yeah. Right? Member of Chiefs Kingdom. So <laughs> hey, thank you. Well, always good. That's right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna formally we're gonna do him right and formally introduce him in just a second. But on a quick programming note, if you enjoy this video interview, be sure to check out our podcast wherever you get your podcast from. We publish Monday through Friday and Greg sometimes Saturday, right? You know, we're very, very busy people, so we <laughs> we just publish all the time. That's right. Well, and we've got all kinds of vehicles now and all kinds of outlets. I mean, you can you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch now, though we're not gamers working on it. Well, anywhere you want to go. Where's the TikTok? Discount. I'm yes. waiting for the TikTok handle. <laughs> uh, you're always yeah. bringing improvement opportunities to it. That's what you're here that. for. <laughs> well, so with no further ado, and, and really kidding aside, you know, we have all these vehicles we publish every day because we love getting as many stories like this and as many leaders like this on the show. Yeah. If we, if, if we, did, if we only publish once a week, we wouldn't be able to get to nearly as many of them. So with no further ado, Jamin Alvidrez, founder of Freight Tribe. Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. Hello. Good, good to be with you both. Thank you so much for having me. You yeah. bet. Well, you know, Greg and I, we, we've been big fans for a while, uh, you know, tracking you on social media. Love your, your, um, your general approach and demeanor, which we'll talk about here later in the interview. And love some of your re recent work with uh, Mad Gaines over at um, Madtropolis. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the, the great citizens of Madtropolis. That's yeah. right. Cassandra, Cassandra Gaines and JD have been great, taught me a ton, and, and I'm really enjoyed that. It's been good stuff. Uh, so, all right. So, for starters, before we dive more into business and get some of your thoughts on global supply chain, let's get to know you a little bit better. So, tell us you know, where you grew up and give us a story or two about your upbringing. Sure. So, I uh, grew up in Orange County, California. Um, and it has been my lifelong hope to not be the annoying version of what that usually means. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, uh, I, I enjoyed growing up here because there's such a diversity of things to do. So I never got into like just one thing, like just being a surfer or just being a skater. Um, I, I like the opportunities of good weather to, to play sports, to go to the beach, go to the mountains, just do it all. What was your so, favorite sport? Football and baseball. It'd be a tie. It'd depend on what okay. day you ask me. Um, what but, position yeah. in both of those did you play? Yeah. Uh, wide receiver for football and baseball, I liked uh, shortstop or third base. Well, you must have been quite an athlete. Well, I didn't say I was good at either at any of those. I liked things. it. Okay. <laughs> I like that's it. a great that's a great qualifier. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. There's a there's a big difference there. But yeah, so I you know, and um Something that was unique about the way I grew up is I uh, grew up in Newport Beach uh, area of Orange County, mm -hmm. super affluent area, and uh, my family wasn't affluent. Um, so while growing up that had different unique challenges I didn't always like, mm. now my perspective on that is I am so appreciative of that because I can really, I don't know how to say it, hang, hang with either side of the spectrum and, mm. and kind of have an understanding. And I think that's what really helped me kind of open up to be able to talk and appreciate a, a wide range of, of people and really engage yeah. empathy at, at either end of the uh, economic scale. That is an outstanding point. Uh, I love how that upbringing gave you a greater sense of empathy. And yeah. my hunch is your sense of gratitude is prob was probably enhanced as well. Yes, absolutely. That's a, that's a really good point. Can't, can't have enough of that if you want to uh, – you know, make, make much of yourself. You got to have, have gratitude or then you just end up being uh, full of anger, frustration, mm. and that won't get you very far. Very true. Well, Greg, let's shift gears and let's yeah. talk more about professional. Yeah. So I'd love to know if there was, as we talk about your professional journey, I'd love to know if there was a life-shaping moment 
in your childhood or, or teen years or, you know, or early adulthood that, you know, kind of helped create your worldview and shaped how, how you came to this profession. But tell us a little bit about that and then take us through your professional journey. Yeah. So this probably speaks really honestly to who I am uh, in that I'm slow. <laughs> so <laughs> th this moment happened in my early 20s when for most people it probably happened in their, their teen years, right? But uh, it was uh, when I moved to Kansas City, there, I, I just got, for lack of a cooler way to say it, just tired of, of being in an area where people were presuming to be cool or better than other people just because they were from a given area. Now, mm. obviously, I'm, I'm speaking to not everyone was like that, but that right. was the vibe I was picking up on. And I had family in the Midwest. I grew up going out there. And just always loved it. It was the people um, yeah. that I dug. So my early 20s, I was like, man, I'm going to just try something different. My uncle was uh, generous enough to say, hey, come on out. You can stay with me and uh, just essentially explore, see what you think. So out to, uh, from California to Overland Park, Kansas, I went. And, oh, man, I just wow. I fell in love with uh, the Midwest and, and Kansas City specifically. And that is when, by accident, <laughs> I fell into supply chain. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I, you know, out there didn't, didn't really know anybody. Just started interviewing. Um, I had a background in, in sales, like talking to people. Um, and so I was interviewing for those types of jobs. And I came upon a freight quote. And I was in there. This was about 2005, 2006. Uh, so they were still a pretty fresh uh, company. And at that time you know, they were really on the cutting edge of, of technology. And so I came right as they were starting to expand and, and add to the team and started in sales. And I was awful. <laughs> so wow. six, six, I can six, vouch for that. I mean, I, I can <laughs> empathize with that. I, yeah. Likewise. What, what made you so bad? Well, and this is where, you know, you would ask what was kind of a a life altering or, or, or changing type of deal. And it, it really happened in this process of moving from California to the Midwest, get, you know, just by nature, having to get yeah. to know myself better, I, totally out of my comfort zone, didn't know anybody. So even just meeting new people explaining, Hey, who's, who's Jamin. And then, um, as I was doing this, this new job in a new industry and I get called in six months in and said, Hey, Jamin, uh, you were fired from sales. Now, how you respond to this next question depends on if you're fired from break quote or not. <laughs> and uh, so this was kind of the next evolution for me. They said, hey, look, you, uh, you have a good attitude and uh, you show up on time. So we want to repurpose you. <laughs> okay. And they, at this time, previous to that, they'd kind of been uh, really focused on the less than truckload mode. And they're like, we're going to start building out um, and trying to capitalize on the uh, full truckload freight that's coming our way. So we're building out a team to talk and negotiate with the, the truckers, start those relationships with uh, capacity. And so for me, that is when the industry uh, supply chain, what a third party logistics provider, what value they could bring. That's when it all just my mind opened up. Mm. And what it was is because I was getting educated on the industry by the actual truckers I was talking to, mm. by those uh, on the dock level or those doing the procurement of, of the transportation and getting to see it from behind the scenes. And I was like, oh, mm. I understand what we do. So I was just awful at sales because I didn't understand what we did. I didn't even fully understand the part we played in the supply chain, all of that. And it was the very, uh, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but the very ground level, the very base yeah, of course. level of our industry trained me up, taught me, and just really opened my mind. Mm. And so that, that was a very, this kind of starts the, the question of my professional career, but also to answer your question, Greg, about pivotal moment for me. Yeah. I was repurposed. So there was a leader uh, that I'll never forget, Lori Whitman. She saw something in me. And just because I sucked at the, the given job I was brought on board for, yeah, that, that wasn't the end of the matter. I wasn't seen as just a title. There was a, per, a person there, and she was going to see how to get the best out of me. And so I'll never forget that lesson. Love that. 
and well, then uh, being trained, like going out and not relying, though, though they're training and onboarding, they did a, a, a good job, right? But it just wasn't in a language I spoke or it wasn't clicking due to, you know, uh, maybe I learned differently. So then going out talking to people mm-hmm. and, and learn that way. There's just no excuse to not go educate and learn and um, so I really learned the value of that. And then third, you know, you don't have to learn from the people call themselves the experts or mm. that are at a high level or have a certain title. Um, a lot of times the people actually touch and doing the, doing the work that can teach you and you can reverse engineer from, from there to more of a, a macro level. But sometimes getting in that micro can mm. be real beneficial. And that, that's when I fell in love. And ever since then, I've been hooked on, uh, on supply chain and, and the people in it. Love it. Um, well, you've got to have a curious spirit, which you enunciated there. And often you, it's best to learn the value you present to the marketplace from the market you present it to. And if oh, that's you're talking well to truckers, you learn from truckers, right? I think so often, you know, when, when people are in a sales environment, so often, often, um, you ought to try this. This is something that a great sales teacher taught me once is hum a song, <laughs> right? Hum a song that you know, and mm-hmm. in your head, you hear the tune, you hear jingle bells or, or, you know, or happy birthday or whatever. Um, and then drum it out, like drum out the melody on, on the table. And you're still hearing it as you drum it out but the person that you're drumming it out for, they have no idea that frame of reference that's in your head. So you have to get outside your own head. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, and actually hum it for that person or hear it from that person to be able to communicate. So, that, it, you know, little tips like that, that's exactly what, uh, what was her first name? Lori, Lori, Lori Whitman. Whitman. Yeah. And that name sounds familiar. Not like everybody from Kansas. City. Knows <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it is one that, of the, that's the what bigger, she, that's bigger what small she towns. knew. Frankly, she must have seen something in you to give you that other chance because that's not a natural thing that happened to you. And you want, and when you say pivotal moment, one of the things you got to think about is that, right? Yeah. And I know you really appreciate that. We just have to share that with the audience because they may not know that, right? We know you fairly well, but um, yeah, that was a great gift that she gave you. Yeah, calling it a gift is the perfect way to put it because that's yeah. truly how I feel about it. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what I really, you know, you say this sometimes, Greg, uh, when I watch these is that I think you put the gift of naivete yeah. or, or some version of that. Yep. And essentially that's what I've tried to hold on to is, is that, you know, curious kind of spirit. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, from, from there, I, you know, I really just embraced it, started opening my mind. Um, and so I did, you know, did really well at, at freight quote, enjoyed it. But uh, often as these stories go, um, was getting homesick after a few, a few years. So I was like, all right. Let's... After some winters? Yeah, in after City. some. <laughs> <laughs> Snow on the ground. Like, hey, how, how yeah. about California? Yeah. Um, so, how you long know, were you there? Uh, just under four years. Okay. Just under four years. You became and... a Chiefs fan in four years. Yeah, and it wasn't during. Well, that was Speaking actually. Pivotal moments. So I yeah. got to ask. I got to ask, Jamin, who was, do you remember? Who was quarter? Give us. Is it was this during? This wasn't during the Christian Okoye days. That was the mid to late eighties. Uh, let's see. I think. Let's see. Uh, it was Elvis Gerbach? Gerbach. Elvis Gerbach. I think. I think Gerbach. And then. Uh, then they went through like Brady Croyle and some of the randoms. It was. It was some lean. <laughs> lean times. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's... But. The, but again, the pot just to be that annoying positive guy. Damon Heward. Yeah. In the lean years you even had to make the tailgating even more of a spectacle. <laughs> yes, I love that. So, right. well, that's you know, what I actually fell in love with first is the tailgating and the hospitality. During a couple of years when I was in Wichita, we, we, I had a, a great opportunity to take in a Chiefs-Broncos game at Arrowhead. Ooh. And, you know, growing up, you know, I didn't go to many football games growing up, but, but uh, as, a, as a young newlywed, we had season tickets at Clemson football back before this run that, that the Tigers had been on. Uh, and that was kind of my – my uh, football experience, right? The big environment. Of course, you're taking Falcons games. Or it's just not the same. But you go to Arrowhead, especially against the Broncos. Mm-hmm. Man, there was so much energy in that stadium. It still oh, yeah. sticks with me because it is such – it is it is so much um, 
there's not as much passion. You don't find that much passion in a lot of pro sports like like what I experienced there in that Chiefs game. So no wonder you got hooked in four yeah. years. Well, and that's the <laughs> – I'm not trying to make this apply. It actually just jogged my memory. Uh, that is what I fell in love with and, and gleaned from my, my initial – time with you know in Kansas City is those people they they go all in I mean they they're all in they uh are behind their team they're they're wearing the gear they're cheering and they are really in the moment when the the Chiefs are playing a Royals or whatever it is Mm -hmm. uh they get that passionate about their their kids sports too and it's like all right it's cool to care like I don't have to you know I kind of I I really appreciated that because uh, at least my interpretation of of some of the the culture I grew up around is more like, oh man, it's not it's not totally cool to care. And I'm like, oh, forget that. Like, this is so this is so neat, and they're having so much fun. I I really uh, enjoyed living learning. life. They're living yeah. life, yeah. and they're they're not scared of letting folks see them enjoy the little things or the big things. Or, you know, uh, I I love kind of what you're putting out here, uh, James. It's so important being being who you are, being transparent. Yeah, uh, being Ooh, real. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, good way to put it. All right, so all right, so keep... we better get you back to work. <laughs> yeah, so, so let's I, talk a little I'm... bit about your career after Freight Quote. Yeah, so uh, had a great relationship with the people I worked with at Freight Quote. They didn't have an office in California, but they were kind enough to uh, essentially hook me up with with C. H. Robinson, my boss's friend. Uh, oh yeah, was, uh, general manager at, at uh, uh, the C. H. Robinson office in L. A. So I went out there, and here I am thinking I'm like pretty hot stuff now like I got this figured out I understand supply chain and I'm doing well um whoa I was I was wrong about when I got into the C.H. Robinson office I mean what a well-oiled machine Mm. and yeah uh, and this is not to speak poorly of freight quote they were you know more in their infancy right uh and so people were just moving fast I felt like I just got promoted from double a to the major leagues and uh, so I had the next evolution of, of learning. And that was another good lesson of, man, like don't, no resting on laurels, no thinking you got it, uh, which is such a foolish thought I was having anyways in our industry. It's so vast and ever changing. And that's the kind of the second part I fell in love with, with supply chain, ever changing, moves quickly, mm-hmm. no end to, to what you could learn. And uh, so I did that, and um, through a series of trying to make this real concise, <laughs> there was a screw up on Christmas <laughs> when I first started working there. It was a, a top 100 account for C.H. Robinson, and it was uh, also privately held. So that's a nice way of me saying the owner can do whatever the heck he wants and be real emotional. <laughs> right. Um, so something went wrong on Christmas Day, and just wasn't having it. So he called up the uh, the owner of that, you know, the general manager and said, look, I want you to fire everyone that works on my account. Mm-hmm. Now, while they did not do that, uh, they did have to remove the people from handling that account. And you're thinking, you know, right around Christmas time and uh, also towards the end of the year and, and yeah. you know, all the quote unquote good people were uh, on accounts, tied to different accounts. So there was one kid who'd been there a couple months and was trying to keep up and find his way. That was definitely free. <laughs> that was yeah. me. So uh, I got picked by nature of that, not not because of anything great I did. And um, this uh, this account was in Otay Mesa, which uh, not sure how many of you are familiar with that is. It is technically America, but it's yep. more like Mexico. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. And yeah. Um, just where you talk about supply a city that exists because of supply chain, just warehouses right, right Mm. there on the border. And I went on site to this account where they um, were running all types of modes from trucks, trains, drop trailer, uh, you know, getting involved in the warehousing, these areas I didn't really touched before. Mm. And so I just applied lessons learned. I was freaked out, overwhelmed. (laughs) I was like, well, so I'm going to remember my experience of freight quote, and I'm just going to go start talking to the people on the dock. As simple as that. I didn't even know what to talk to them about, per se. I, did, I definitely <laughs> didn't know what I didn't know, but I knew anything they shared with me was an improvement. When's from, lunch? Like, yeah. What's a good place to eat? <laughs> oh, yeah. the taco trucks were amazing. So that actually, what, yeah. I did get those tips from them as well. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd 
do that. I'd bring coffee because I was like, I, got, I don't have much value to, to add <laughs> really. And, but I'll bring them coffee, I, you know, and I would talk to the people at the dock and in the warehouse. And then I was like, well, let's just take this up the, the chain, if you will. So then their boss, I was talking to them the same way. And then finally, you know, I'm talking, engaging with the owner in the very same way. I didn't change my questions or my attitude and people really opened up. And that's when I realized like, oh, being vulnerable and not getting too caught up in adding value, there is actually a value in being vulnerable and mm. honest and open and doing what you can. They could, they could tell like, they didn't expect me to know everything or be the, the savior of their supply chain. Right. I, I had some coffee and a, a good attitude and, and want and listen to them. And yep. so that lesson, I was so grateful to, to get to have. Mm. Um, so yeah, never be afraid to be the dumbest person in the room. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> we the, had, the truth is most people will think, okay, well, Jamin, he's a pretty smart guy. So if he's asking questions, I must not have given him all the information that he wants. I mean, everybody has that kind of imposter syndrome. So they're always looking at how have I failed if he has to ask that question, right? Yeah. And that's, that's where I think that it, like the way you say it, the gift of naivete, it's not the curse. Not yeah. knowing isn't the curse. Oh, it's a gift. Oh, I have an opportunity to ask a question. So it's all about yeah. how we frame it in our minds. Hmm. Yeah, no doubt. Sorry, Scott, go ahead. No, no. Please. I'm so excited to be talking to him. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, add um, to some of our listeners that may not um, be in the world of supply chain and, and dealt with putting out the fires and, and all the stress that comes with, you know, getting the right thing at the right price and the right location at the right time. As you might imagine, there's a ton of pressure in these production environments. So um, if you're someone that, that lives that every day for a warm, welcoming, person to come in that is willing to listen to you and be kind of that, that respite from yeah. that, that hard charging environment. I can see, I've never really thought about that much, uh, Jamin, but I can see where, you know, no wonder folks loved when you came around and, and, and the value you brought being who you are. Yeah. It, it, I think you said that really well, like the, you know, being the respite, being refreshing. Um, and that was something I came up upon on, on accident. Um, but then it really started to realize you know, we see this today too, even in, in social media or putting content out, oh, add value, bring value. That's speaking for myself. That's a lot of pressure. And then how do you define value? Sometimes value to someone is just listening or uh, saying a hi to them. And they're like, Oh, but that was a sincere high, like, you know, right. And, or, or being open in different ways. So uh, just reframing, that add value or what do I need to do in the situation? It's, we don't have to be a, a miracle worker in, in every situation or have the, the amazing answer or anything like that. And that's what I love about supply chain is it's not, all the pressure is not on a singular person to have the answer. Yeah. And there's can, almost yeah. never a singular answer. Yeah. That's a good point. Right. Well, I mean, we're experiencing that now. Everybody is down on lean and I, I admit I'm no fan of lean, but mostly they're trying to boil the problems with what happened w when this seismic societal disruption occurred initially to one thing. And it wasn't one they're looking thing. for a scapegoat. It, it right? was a confluence of, of many, many aspects of supply yeah. chain. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of lean have been for years. I think there's a lot of companies that misapply it and they put it under the lean flag and it's not, it's yeah. just an excuse to do different things. And that's what gives the, the, the methodology and the approach, such a bad reputation with a lot of folks. Um, and that's a leadership problem, but nevertheless, I, Greg, you make a great point because there's a lot of folks that are looking for that one thing. Oh, it was his or her fault, or it was this fault. Yeah. And to your point, this, this it's not that simple. Well, and the truth is if you look at, at things this complex, that simple, you actually in, in your haste to try to add value or provide an answer, you actually make yourself look immature and, and actually naive. Yeah. Yeah. Right? The, because, the bad, the bad side of naive. Yeah. Those in the know, know you don't know. Right. Yeah. When you, when you make uh, statements like that. So you, yeah. it, it's better to be genuine, better to be careful, better to be less hyp hyperbolous. Is that a word? Sounds good it to is, me. It is now. I like it. <laughs> it rolled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it rolled pretty good, didn't it? 
Um, but you know, if, if we could take it one step further, because I think this is a really important point to make. I think in search of margins and margin ad, companies have taken certain methodologies to the to the absolute extreme. You're right. And and it and what that has done, and 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 again, not put. It's, we're all in search of gains, right? And ads and and more value, whether they're taking care of our customers or the bottom line. But what that does is puts you in a bad position for one of the most unique curveballs that the industry has ever seen. So I think that needs to be stated. I think we're going to see some adjustments. You know, we've talked earlier about the grocery supply chain in particular and just how lean they, they kept things where as the industry has evolved in recent years yeah. uh, at the regional level. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see kind of what the, um, what the, the new position, what the fallback position is based on the learnings from, you know, what, what 2020 has brought us. Yeah. Yeah, don't yeah, overreact, people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, ditch, right, so, the, the old ditch to ditch, huh? That's yeah, our, right. our human nature. <laughs> that's right. Well, ditch throw to it ditch. all away. That's right. I love that. So you can tell to... he learned how to drive in Kansas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, Jamin, sorry to sorry to take a hard just, right turn there. But... No, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do a harder what right, the heck? really Go for quick. It, man, a U-turn. Uh, you said ditch to ditch. So, truly, my first uh, this is a quick story, but the first time my tires hit Kansas was in the middle of a ice storm. Ooh. I did, had no respect or understanding of what that really meant. The only thing I knew is, man, I, I hit the, that Colorado-Kansas border. Um, I had a few hours to drive, and I couldn't stop because USC's bowl game uh, was <laughs> – football bowl game was starting. And so I was like, nope, I'm going. Well, about an hour in, I hit some ice and ended up in a ditch. Uh, just outside the fine uh, town of Grainfield, Kansas. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> Where they came and, you know, uh, a wrecker pulled me out. You know, I wasn't hurt. I wasn't Clam. going fast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, they put me up in a, a house uh, for the for a few hours and uh, until I was able to get a ride uh, into Kansas City. But, yeah. So, truly, that is how I learned to drive in, in uh, Kansas was ditch to ditch. <laughs> And Malcolm just shot me a note that the population of Greenfield, Kansas is 277 folks. So hopefully one of those 277 folks came to your aid then. They did. Oh, they were super nice. I mean, there was, um, <clears throat> so it was an ice storm. It was a serious deal that actually shut down power. And um, so they had a, a small contingent of the National Guard uh, come there with uh, generators and uh, we're going around to the homes, checking on, on everybody and especially the older folks and some who didn't have a, a good setup. We were all in the, um, I think it was the Elks Lodge uh, there, the little, it's a little one room and uh, people from the town brought some food and uh, nice. there was about, about 30 of us. Some others had gotten in accidents too. I wasn't the only one, which actually made me feel good. Yeah, that's, that had that's to make not, you feel better, right? Yeah, that's not a good thought, right? <laughs> like, that's, I guess, a, a negative for them. But, uh, yeah, and they, they made us food, and, and we, we hung out. So, yeah, Love it. it was a warm welcome <laughs> to it. Kansas, but a rough one. So, were they good spare ribs that they made you, or...? Yeah, you know, I think I got, uh, what I get? I got cornbread, potato salad, and ham. <laughs> okay, and it was good. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about Freight Tribe, Greg. Wait, is it time yet? Are I we sure it's... he hasn't been fired from his latest job yet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the jig wasn't up. I can make it real. I can make it real short. Yeah, please. Come on. Let's I, do it. I, I ping ponged, right? So I was at CH Robinson. Another lesson. I burned out uh, four years on site. No cool way to put it. 100% on me. This wasn't a, a company thing. Mm. I just went all in. Loved it so much, and being on site at a facility that ran 24/7, my mind started to work that way. And I loved mm. going. To, oh, problem at 3 a.m. I'm different. I'll be there and check, you know, on the dock and that sort of thing. No dramatic story or or anything like that. No other ditch to ditch driving or anything crazy. I just like lost my my love of of what we do. Mm. And uh, so I had a very frank conversation with. Uh, my, my boss at the time told him, I was like, Hey, I just got to step back. And, and so I, I resigned from that. He was super, you know, everyone was really great about it, but supply chain, I just can't quit you. It's basically where it's like after it's like a couple addiction. months. Yeah. After a couple months, I, and I had the realization, right. Cause when I burned out, I didn't fully realize I had burned out or why I, I couldn't articulate it the way I'm saying it now. Yeah. Yep. And so then about that time, uh, 
I got a call from uh, my old boss at uh, Freight Quote. And he was like, look, we got this Land of Misfit Toys team that uh, from an acquisition they had done, they don't quite fit in the model of what Freight Quote is right now, but we want to, uh, um, we want to integrate them and also integrate their customers that are sort of unique. Um, so why don't you come back on out to the Midwest and, and uh, have a go at it. <laughs> and so uh, that's, what, uh, that's what I did. Um, went out, moved the family. Now at this point, I had a couple kids. Went out to the Midwest and uh, led a team of about 25 people that were like me. They were a little unique, land of, land of misfit toys, if you will. <laughs> and, uh, and that was, that was great because it was kind of, you know, it was the next evolution without mm. realizing it, the next evolution of applying lessons learned mm. getting to share them with the different people on the team and take this team and even, you know, out their customers and start, you know, taking them as a singular person and backing it out into a singular vision. So instead of just talking at all these people the same, I was like, wow, let me remember things like what Lori Whitman did for me and seeing me as a very specific and unique person. And then, you know, on to the next, on to the next. And what amazed me and was awesome is to see how that actually then brings out sort of a, a singular voice or a, a mission. And that's when I really started to identify with, um, started to think about applying these things towards leadership and the unique opportunities within our business to apply that kind of basically wrangle the unique. <laughs> wow. And, uh, so I, I had a good time doing that. And during that time, CH Robinson bought freight quote. So I was back under the snowflake again and uh, <laughs> went and ran a sales team there for a little bit. So you and learned how to sell. So I learned, yeah, I finally learned how to sell. Well, funny you say that, right? Because uh, just to be super raw and transparent, notice along this way, I hadn't totally sold again. Mm. So I had that chip on my shoulder or the, in, that's a cool way to say it. It was an yeah. insecurity. I had an insecurity <laughs> or, you know, a chip right. on my shoulder. This doesn't own me. I can do this. Yeah. So uh, I had gotten into sales leadership's position. I could train sales. I was good at it, but I still was like, man. And, you know, I'd go do presentations and all that kind of stuff, but frontline, real sales from intro to close, I had not had a full-blown go at it. Mm -hmm. So uh, also about the time, I was like, man, all right, I want to try expanding uh, my experience. And so I went to a startup there in, in the Kansas City area, Ag Force, and it was sweet because it was the next evolution. And it was, you know, in some ways, I guess you could view it if we're just talking on paper linearly a step back but i got to sell from intro to to close hmm. and do essentially enterprise sales for them with a, a a smaller team and um i just what was the product there i learned a Damn. ton they're a 3pl as well so oh, they know what okay. i was selling yeah um uh drive in uh temp controlled and, and intermodal were the three main okay uh products i was selling hmm. and uh so then, yeah, that, it, it just was, was awesome. Um, and then that's, that's becoming more near term, um, had to, now I'm back in California. Um, they, uh, do not have an office in California. And so they're like, man, also the labor laws in California, we're not looking to add a <laughs> California employee. If you move anywhere else, like we got yeah. you. Um, so I, I was like, no, that that's all right. So that's then what, uh, had to come back out to California. My mother uh, had been in poor health for a lot of years, but uh, it was really getting down to it. And um, I have three kids and wanted them to get to experience being around her, uh, watch some, some USC football with her uh, kind of for her last season and, and little fan. things like that. Huge fan, yeah, big, big awesome. part of my family. So uh, that, that brought me back to California. And now that's where Freight Tribe came about. Okay. And um, really what Freight Tribe is, look, I got, I'll break rules again. <laughs> Technically, I'm supposed to give a real concise answer, right? Like that's the, <laughs> that's the smart thing to do in introducing I, a business. <laughs> I think we could be pressing up against a couple hours, but why not? Let's yeah. experiment and see how long we can make a podcast go. Yeah. So the short of it is Freight Tribe, you know, I wanted to take everything I learned and help pass it on to people. So um, help them tell their story, cut through noise, 
And you know, whether that be through social selling, social media, or platforms like this, mm -hmm. um, I'm trying really hard not to be honest, but it's just going to slip out. I was like, man, I want to be the Ryan Seacrest of supply chain. <laughs> Ryan Seacrest, that's who you picked of all the people? That, I, well, I said I was trying not to be honest. That, <laughs> you know where familiar. Ryan Seacrest is from, right? I actually don't. I, I don't know a lot about him. Oh, yeah. oh, you know what? I did, I did remember hearing that. Yep. But I was like, man, here's a guy. He like walks his line. He sets up people, you know, and the different things he's on. He sets them up. He, you know, I started to understand that I have a, a talent is what I started to see it as for – bringing energy and firing people up and essentially helping people see things in themselves that they weren't seeing yep. and push them along. I, I don't have to be the center of attention. So to have the balance of bringing energy and not be the center of attention, I was like, Oh, that's, that's something that there's a need for. Cause usually you see what the people who bring a lot of energy, sometimes they also have to be like the person and they can be super annoying, <laughs> at least to me. <laughs> You may have missed that. Scott's looking at me. I, I saw that, Greg. <laughs> and, to our, and to our listeners, uh, Jamin may have just uh, identified and defined other folks in the room, which shall remain named. <laughs> so, all right. I don't mean but, to do it. No, that's hilarious. But so, yeah, that, that's what's interesting, try. Jamin, it was in, so interesting to me. And I don't know if you are just a psychologist by nature or are you that school of hard knocks. <laughs> well, you know, you, you really, um, it's almost like you're an engineer of introspection. I mean, it's, yes. it almost sounds That's like a method. great way to describe it. Yeah. It sounds like it's, it's almost just in his DNA. It's, it's methodical to how he can, he regularly inventories his qualities or his experiences or his, um, you know, where he wants to get better or what he's really good at. I mean, it really is very unique. Oh, yeah. Th thank you. Yeah. And, you know, articulate, coming to understand it, it, it's just now, you know, coming to me, if you want to say it that way. And I've, so Freight Tribe came about as the testing ground to see what I could do with that. <laughs> and I don't have, I think, you know, I think it'd be cooler if I said I had the answer and here specifically what I offer. Right. What I've been finding is I'm, I'm working with, you know, lending my experience, um, consulting with some other three PLs, given my 16 plus years in that area. Um, but I'm really interested in this and uh, this type of medium to set people up uh, similar to, to what you guys do. Uh, Sarah Barnes Humphrey has been huge on helping me figure some of these things out as well. And um, so it's, I really want to make this sound correct um, and not uh, rude, but it's been a real positive side. The timing of, of this uh, global pandemic mm. with the, the human thing set aside, yeah. uh, the timing, because this all started before the timing was perfect as I've gotten to just really network and learn and see what's out there. And, and uh, that's what I would say to, to anyone out there is, man, there is endless opportunities to go and just, just talk to people, meet people, connect. It is, it is wild to me how little I had leveraged that over my years. And so now I'm just, you know, I want to preach about it to everybody and, and myself make up for some lost time. Love yeah. it. Well, you know, uh, you've spoken already extensively. And if you can't, if you don't pick up passion and a huge passion for supply chain in the first half of this interview, then, then maybe you got to check your pulse because <laughs> Jamin brings it in load. So, so really we've got a good feel for what, um, why you're so passionate about supply chain, um, especially going back to how you were talking about how the, the environment is ever changing and you're, you have to lose, learn something new probably every hour, not even every day, every hour. Uh, it's one yeah. of those, one of those environments that as Greg mentioned earlier, there hardly is ever one answer. And if there is, it's going to be a different answer the next day. <laughs> next time. Yeah. Right. Um, all right. So let's, well, you know what, let's, let's make sure what else uh, I'm saying there's, you've already answered that, but what else did we not tackle that makes you so passionate about supply chain? Well, and I, I'd love to know. I, I, I also, I want I need to know the answer to this question. I'm sorry, guys, <laughs> I'm making myself the center of this again. I need to know the answer to this question. So I got you. Yeah. If, if I'm walking down the hall 
This is my favorite question. You listen to us. You know this question is coming. I know it's coming. If I'm walking down the hall and I've got a heaviness on my heart, I've got a pain in my business, I've got keywords in my brain. What are the keywords? What is the pain that I'm feeling? What is the thing I'm trying to escape that makes me know that I need to call you at Freight Tribe? What, what is, what's your superpower? Yeah, I, I did. I do remember you asking that question. I, I like that a lot. Um, for me, I'm, you know, and it's a bit of an evolution, but I have been amazed at how hard it is for people to communicate what they do on social platforms um, and even to their teams, right? Because people act like a, a LinkedIn or, you know, Instagram, Facebook. These are just communication tools. Yeah. Um, email out to your teams. Uh, connecting with people, you know, text with your team's phone, all just communication tools. Um, so I think a lot of, I'm finding people struggle to truly connect because they put yeah. in too many buzzwords. They, they're not vulnerable. They don't actually share, uh, you know, they'll, a lot of times leaders will have visions, but they almost, I don't know if it's too intimate or if they think it's too simplistic or what it is, they don't share it. Uh, I think, that we lose sight of that. And something that I really am fascinated by, and I, I enjoy helping people with, how do you talk with people, not at people? Um, you can scroll through a LinkedIn or through Twitter or something. It is amazing how many people talk at you. And even though it's just words, it, it feels like being talked at. And it's actually hard to, you know, it, especially on a medium like email or Twitter or a LinkedIn, it's tough. I don't know how many messages I erase. I'm like, oh, whoa, I accidentally was talking at people, telling them what to do. And it's like, just reframe it uh, into questions or thoughts or some, you know, some vulnerability. Um, and so that's what I love to really dig in and, and help people with that. Uh, and this, the second part of that is uh, people really have, I, I think given people have usually the answers, um, so I'm not a guy that has the right answers in most cases, but I pride myself on having the right questions. Yeah. Uh, to, be able to, to extract that. Out. Yeah. That's great. And so are they, I mean, are they struggling to, I mean, are these companies that you're dealing with or people that you're dealing with, are they selling 3PL services or are they buying 3PL services or are they selling trucking, you know, LTL or truckload or buying it or? Yeah, it what? tends to be uh, freight brokerages, 3 pl services, especially when you get into that. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen this a, a million times over. As you start to scale out a business, you know, you started with your, your buddies, your, your friends, a small group of people. But, and you, as you scale, you get so focused on the business, you just assume that the message and communication is continuing. But as you get closer to that $100 million in sales mark, seems to happen somewhere in that. Yep. 75 to $100 million mark, you start hitting up on a ceiling of being able to scale and ignite people at scale and uh, deliver a, a concise message that everyone gets behind the same way it was when it was just, you know, you and a couple other people in a room together. Yeah. Yep. That's interesting. That's an interesting dynamic. So it you're is. helping people bust through that. Yeah. Yeah. That's and awesome. that's what, and that's too, what I like about th this format of, of, you know, podcasts or, or video and, and social medias, yeah. uh, you can really, you know, make people feel good, make them feel secure. Even if they're not working with, you know, me per se, uh, they can then start applying and, and doing these. It's very simple, right? It's not easy, but it's very simple. And so I, I enjoy putting it out there because it's, you know, lessons I acquired from other people. I didn't, I didn't pay for the lessons. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's um, cool. It is. It's fascinating. It's very unique. Uh, the niche you have found, especially where there's a huge gap in the market and there's a huge skill set and, and experience and, and expertise you bring. It'll be interesting to bring you back on and, and kind of see as uh, a freight tribe evolves. And um, it's just exciting. Love, love to hear it firsthand in terms of, of what it does and, and the opportunities you see. So let's when I come back with frosted tips, when I take the Ryan, Ryan Seacrest with supply chain too far, <laughs> it's a hundred million dollar business. Free tri tribe is breaking through walls and, 
and right. busting through things. I love it. A huge opportunity there. <laughs> we'll be um, right back. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk, let's go, let's go broader with the conversation. Let's, let's move, you know, there, there's no shortage of um, issues and challenges and problems or innovation, you name it. The world supply chain is even prior to the pandemic. Um, there was a millions and millions of things to track, but right now today, you know, here in late May, 2020, what's a couple of things, couple of issues or challenges or, or trends that you're tracking more than others, Jamin? Yeah, you know, um, as I tend to do, I think about the people, right? So I'm just really fascinated to see what will happen um, with the workforce, with the talent. And um, you all discussed uh, this with Sarah Barnes Humphrey recently, and I, I was fascinated by it. What is it going to look like? Will people start to understand the talent pool they now have to pick from, even you know, globally, as we've we've started to test out and get more comfortable with work from home and be like, oh man, now I'm not, you know, uh, confined by, you know, a a handful of zip codes where people could come into the office. Mm -hmm. I could find a, a talented uh, person in you know Brazil and or wherever it may be or wherever in the United States and, and vice versa. So I'm really fascinated to see that play out and to see if organizations truly understand what an awesome opportunity we have there. Yeah. Um, and then more on a, a, I guess a little nerdy level is to see as people start diversifying um, their sourcing and, and their manufacturing, will 3D printers, uh, you know, how will we start engaging, you know, utilizing them and, and uh, will it be more at scale? I'm, I'm super fascinated by that. Yes, we are too. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, we're, we had someone, we're going to go back to this phrase again, finding opportunity and not being opportunistic in the pandemic environment. You know, the, the, the sheer amount of innovation, whether it's brand new technology or if it's technology that's been around forever, you know, it, it'd be really interesting in the months ahead to see the, the, the real practical, successful, effective innovation that comes out of uh, in supply chain out of the pandemic uh, era. Greg, we've talked about that quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, you know, first of all, so many companies are thinking about reshoring or China plus one, two, three, or nearshoring or, or whatever. But, you know, the, the fact is that's going to take a lot of automation. And I think we're entering a time in society in the in our workforce and frankly with the kind of work that automation typically does where the the largest generations in the workforce now don't fear automation they welcome automation and that's a good thing because if we're going to have any Agreed. opportunity to compete against china and those low prices that we want so badly automation is going to be absolutely required wild, wild, wild opportunity on the where at the warehouse level for automation. It is yes. amazing how old school the, the uh, warehouse operations are. It, yep. You know, it, it's also interesting, Jamin, to see how regional that is. Um, because 10 years ago, um, Lorna Stangeland, who was at the time uh, CEO of Vectura, which was a wine and spirits distributor, one of my favorites, um, <laughs> favorite industry. Um, they had a completely lights out warehouse except for their um, vintage wines. Mm. Product was, was received. It was put away. It was taken out. It was picked. It was packed. It was shipped all by robotics. In, and that was in Norway. So, um, you know, of course, labor is very expensive in Norway. So sure. it makes, makes, uh, good sense to do that but the technology is there is the willpower there to do it and i think we finally reached a threshold in terms of generations in the workforce that will accept it and yeah. that eliminates menial and dangerous and um and um unsatisfying work and work conditions for human beings and they get to elevate to the next level that's right and that that's really exciting. Like that that excites me. What you just hit on there. And that's, I say a lot. Of adapt and thrive. Kind of my positive take on on adapt or die, uh, because that's where I think we can really you know 10x ourselves as as people. Is when we realize that automation, robotics, it's not the enemy. Um, it is the enemy, and if you don't want to change, 
Um, right. And you don't, you know, expand your mind, learn new skill sets and understand that, you know, dancing in unison with these, these new uh, strategies can just open up the world to you. And yeah, you, you might have to, you not might, you'll learn new skill sets. You might, you know, the job you did yesterday will be different tomorrow, but that yeah. can be such a liberating thing if we just, if we let it. Well, and those skilled trades that remain in human hands, they still will be there and they still will pay more. I mean, look, we had 2 million unful, unfilled trade jobs wow. when the employment level was 96.5%. 2 million jobs were going unfilled. Wow. Welders and plumbers and, and various and sundry other trade jobs. So those good paying jobs will be there and the more menial tasks will be handled by automation. Mm. So, well, before we ask uh, Jamin the trade dollar question, I want to ask Greg the million dollar question, which is what the heck is various and sundry? Various and sundry. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it that is a, a lot of a lot of stuff. Did I say that? That is, that is I bet <laughs> it we, it is a quota. You got to get one in every episode, Greg. It is definitely a Greg Whiteism. Various and sundry. So that just means a bunch of stuff, really. <laughs> I dig it. You got to remember my great grandparents were around when I was a kid and they talked like it was vaudeville every day. You must crush cr crossword puzzles. Yes. Oh, oh dude. I bet. You have no idea. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Just pick I it have up no right idea. Here. Um. So let's go back to the talent piece real quick before we move on yeah. to start to, to wind things down. Let's talk about talent for a minute. Clearly it's, it's something you're tracking, something you're passionate about. Um, you, you know, we talked the other day, I can't remember who we were talking with Greg, but we were talking about um, in the months ahead as folks move more to remote working permanently, we've seen mm -hmm. companies, you know, shutting down hundreds of locations, right? And the industry is going to figure this out. Some folks will be back, to the new normal in person, of course, other professional services and some other, other, you know, non-factory and non and, and other sectors may very well not. How do we, um, Jamin, what impact do you think that's going to have on uh, onboarding talent and, and, and getting folks, you know, think of, think of some recent college graduates as, as they move into the career force and they're joining companies for the first time and they're, you know, they're not bonding with their employees in, or with their team members in person or their managers or what have you, what, how, how are companies going to break through that? You think? Well, I think that's a, I've had a concern come up uh, for many, but uh, this might be somewhat of a hot take. I think it's going to improve onboarding and I think it's going to improve, you know, uh, or advance uh, culture um, because now we can't rest on the laurels of, Oh, hey, they're just going to assimilate tribal our knowledge, culture. right? They're going to, yeah, tribal perfect. That's the perfect way to say it. They're not going to just learn by, we, we've gotten, uh, and I noticed it with myself when I was training and onboarding new people. I was like, oh, shoot, I'm getting a little lazy, ha expecting them just to assimilate, hear conversations. Oh, just go sit with rep so and so. And so I think it's going to force us to be um, more intentional with the training more intentional with defining what our culture is because right now culture, if we're not careful, could just be, Oh, Hey, we have beer Fridays and there's a bag set with our company logo on it and some ping pong. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's if you're a real, a, a top company. Uh, so, you know, we can accidentally, and I would go on a limb and say we have gotten a little lazy with onboarding and culture. And this is going to force us to really be intentional, really define it, articulate it. And then the other piece of it is, man, these, uh, you know, we're talking specifically onboarding new ones like college age. How do you think they're forming friendships and connecting right now? So I think a lot of some of the, the fears we have are limitations of how we connect or what we need. That generation, they're making great connections uh, yeah. digitally. So they're, they're more advanced than us in that way. So I actually think it's going to be better long run. I don't think it's a hot take at all. I think that is a very smart take, Greg. Yeah. What, what's, your, uh, what's your take on Jamin's hot on take? On Jamin's take? I think that's an, that's an incredible take. Honestly, I was mostly thinking about it. I, I'm not sure there's much more that I can add there. But, um, yeah, that, 
I had not thought about the fact that this is another situation of necessity as the mother of invention. Yeah. And, and we will persevere through this as well. Right. And yep. we will be better for it. adapt and thrive. Yeah. But I <laughs> All like, right. So one quick, one quick comment. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. like how Jamin talked about, we're, we're going to, it's going to force us to get more intentional. Yes. Because you know, some of these processes, whether it's talent related or, or other aspects of a business, we can get real clingy to that's how we all, we've always done it. And we got a process for that. Well, if this, if it's bad process, you know, we got, we, we got to be intentional about making it more effective for whether it's, you know, customers or new customers or new right. employees or, or for that matter, team members that have been there for been part of the organization for a while. So I love yeah. that phrase getting a lot more intentional about uh, fixing fixing what probably is broken, whether they, whether companies realize it or not. All right. So Greg, go right All ahead. All right. So uh, speaking of phrases that we have come across this week, Scott has coined this phrase. And I mean, it blew my mind when he <laughs> said it. I, I almost fell out of my chair. We were in the middle of recording. Um, and he, he has coined this phrase, the trillion dollar question. You used to say, the $64,000 question, then the $64 million <laughs> question. He skipped right over billions and went right to <laughs> trillions. And I think that is so appropriate. So um, first, let me just say that uh, as a, a bit of a, an homage to you, you can see some of my uh, gear in the back here, my Otis Taylor jersey, my favorite chief of all time, and my autographed Lynn Dawson um, photograph, now my second favorite Chiefs quarterback ever, but also a Super Bowl <laughs> champion. Um, so I wanted you to show, I want to show off my background so you feel comfortable showing off your background when I ask you this question, and that is, you have been a Chiefs fan for a good long while, right? Yes. And you have gone through a lot as a person, and obviously you are very introspective. How do you say stay so positive all the time and What's the magic? What's your mantra? What's your methodology for being so up and being able to deliver that upness, that upliftingness to other people? But first, before you answer that, show people, take a step back and show people your backdrop so they can yep. see the whole word all at once. Yeah. Right? There, there you go. go. Thrive. <laughs> yeah. On, on chalk on chalkboard going old yeah school. man that's old school i like that <laughs> yeah. you're like one of those vintage guys that yeah, drive oh, yeah. seven chevy <laughs> that'd be cooler if i did that yeah, part old of it. Yeah. Soul. <laughs> um you know it i gotta say it's my mother uh she passed away in in january and uh for a number of years my my childhood uh till till the, the day she died um she had various health problems and man, it did not limit her. And it was, she was never, uh, she never shy about sharing that uh, there's not a secret sauce. They, you don't, there's no magic pill. There's nothing. It's just your mindset. Like you, you're got to, you know, life will be tough sometimes. You can accept that. So, uh, and not have to try to make it all pretty. So she was really, really good at drilling into me the power of a positive mindset. It's not a fake mindset. It's not accepting reality and, and just, you know, living in the clouds. And that's what I think makes it genuine. And uh, so her mantra, and it goes back to uh, USC football. Um, that's not University of South Carolina. That's uh, the no, USC. That is not USC. <laughs> Uni Thank you. University Thank you of Southern that. California. <laughs> There's only one USC. <laughs> I was a big part of uh, her childhood and, and, and on the mine. And uh, fight on is, yeah. is their, their battle cry. And it truly uh, became her mantra of, look, life's going to kick you in the teeth. Things will change. It's not always going to be ideal, but the idea of fight on, you have control. We each have control. We each have options. They're not always great. It's not always going to be a blast or feel good or anything. It doesn't have to be. So I just find a lot of positivity in her example as she uh, battled her cancers throughout the years never was negative, never woe is me. Um, and just fought on with, uh, with a smile. Cause you're going to have to go through it anyways, might as well <laughs> smile and, and, right. and try to make other people around you feel good. Um, so I just really, really took that in from her. And now I'm just, uh, doing my damnedest to, to carry that on. That's awesome. 
That's fantastic. You know, somebody said to me once a long time ago, for, I mean, first of all, yeah, I think I told you, live with my great grandparents. They went through the Dust Bowl 10 years of, and this was during the depression, right? There were no jobs. Then there was no soil. Then there were no plants. Then there were no animals. And every day, just every day, they thought it was going to be better. And how could you not leverage that to, to have an upbeat spirit? You know, somebody once said to me, I can't even remember who it was, there is abundance in the, in the universe. Thanks to whatever you believe your higher power to be, there is abundance in the universe. And that, um, you know, I think that pulls a lot of people through, right? Mm -hmm. To know that there is the opportunity. And Scott is a great example of that. We end every show with that. And it's inspirational um, for people to be that uplifting. So, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I'm happy for you. I'm happy for us to be able to experience you and for everyone <laughs> out there to get a, a little slice of your knowledge and of your uplifting spirit, um, you know, to, to help people through their day, through their life, through their career, right? It's very real, very genuine. And yeah. it comes across your social media presence. So to our listeners, if you're not following or connected to uh, Jamin on LinkedIn or Twitter or the other channels where he's, he's active, go out and do it because it will brighten your day. It'll, it will inspire you. No doubt. Um, and it's good stuff. All right. So let's make sure, Jamin, that our audience knows how to connect with you. Uh, and, and of course, the Freight Tribe initiative. I'd say that probably the best way is on uh, LinkedIn, uh, Jamin, J-A-M-I-N, trying the whole Oprah Madonna thing and just going Love with it. a singular One name. <laughs> well, Love Jamin, it. rocket ship. What's the other thing? Truck. Truck. <laughs> truck. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would love to engage with anyone. And that's LinkedIn is how I uh, came across uh, you guys a while back and so many others. So yeah. that would even be my other plug just for LinkedIn, Twitter, where there is speaking of abundance an abundance of people to learn from that are putting awesome stuff out there. Uh, so it's great. Yeah. Outstanding. Uh, all right. So uh, thanks so much. This has been in the works for a while. Uh, really, it was, it was, it surpassed even our high expectations. Oh, because no, thank you. I, I enjoyed it. Got a great yeah. story. Great perspective. I think m more folks should hear it. So we're going to have you back on. Uh, so to our audience, stay tuned for that. that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, all right. So, Greg, good stuff. Uh, we, we should give uh, Jamin Al Alvarez with Freight Nailed Tribe the, for <laughs> the formal thank you, and we'll have yeah. you back, right? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for coming in by standing up wherever you are. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's been a blast. And, you know, I think we already felt like we know you, knew you, but now I feel like we really do know you. And I, I think our listeners, our audience is really going to enjoy this. Yeah, agreed. Oh, great. All Thank right. You so much. thanks so much, Jamin. We'll have you back. Greg, real quick, we want to invite folks to check out Supply Chain Trivia on June 3rd at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. It's our set Eastern. Your, set your alarm clock, Jamin, because that's 6.30 <laughs> your time. <laughs> Eastern I'm Hemisphere. I'm telling you, you're going to have some tough competition because that's still daylight hours for people in in – Eastern Europe and and even Western Asia. So, and we already know you've been, you've been on this before. We know people in India will stay up till two thirty, three o'clock in the morning to do this. So when they still have a, a night's sleep ahead of them, I can't even imagine what the competition is going to be. Like. <laughs> well, it's, it's going to be a fierce competition, yeah. undoubtedly. Our third edition, we're partnering with Sapix, which is an yeah. outstanding supply chain organization doing big things in Africa and, and beyond. Uh, Jenny Froome, uh, in particular, uh, their COO, uh, has been a great uh, collaborator in the past. In fact, we, we interviewed her early on in yeah. our Full Access series, Greg, going yeah, back we need probably to get about her a year. On again. That's right. All right, you, uh, to our listeners, you can check that out, as well as all, all of our other resources and podcasts, live streams, you name it, supplychainnowradio.com. And on behalf of Jamin, on behalf of Greg White and Scott Luton, we wish our listeners nothing but the best. As Greg alluded to earlier, much brighter days absolutely lie ahead. And we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.